Okay, here we go. Uh, another amazing talk in defense of relativity deniers. First of all, it's worth making a note that calling people who disbelieve Einstein's relativity as relativity deniers is an attempt to ridicule them. Actually, they are, they are relativity skeptics. You know, i.e. they're skeptical of Einstein's relativity because it doesn't make sense. In the early days of Einstein's relativity, there were people saying Einstein's relativity was wrong and they became called relativity deniers. Uh, I'm going to look at an article dealing with that. This is the article from New Scientist. Uh, Einstein skeptics who were the relativity deniers question mark starts off by saying when people don't like what science tells them they resort to conspiracy theories mudslinging and plausible pseudo science as Einstein discovered I don't recognize the source of this statement. It would be nice to have a reference where Einstein saying he discovered this. But with articles like this, like this one, uh, they tend to not give references and tend also to give just unsupported opinions of the writer. Anyway, the article says, this world is a strange madhouse remarked Einstein in 1920 in a letter to his close friend, mathematician Marcel Grossman. And he says, every coachman, every waiter is debating whether relativity theory is correct. Belief in the matter depends on political affiliation. Uh, so um, my comment is, so Einstein is admitting his physics is a political issue. Those of a certain political point of view are more ready to accept his theories than a different political point of view. Physics stroke science faced a problem with different religious points of view in Galileo's time, but now it's moved on to political differences. Artur says Einstein's general theory of relativity published in 1915 received an overwhelming public response, not all of it positive. Numerous accounts, which appeared during the 1920s, claimed to show relativity is wrong. And Einstein received many letters from lay people who were saying that sort of thing. Um, me, my comment is people say Einstein relativity is wrong, had early beginnings, Einstein becomes famous 1919 and almost immediately there were some people saying he was wrong. Article says many of today's physicists and astronomers, uh, not to mention science journalists, uh, continue to receive this kind of mail. Uh, on densely written pages and increasingly in rambling emails, blog posts and online comments. Self-proclaimed scientists keep trying to foister their astonishing simple solutions to much discussed problems upon genuine academics. My comment on that, much of it is probably for me. I've sent to people like Patrick Moore, Hawking and so forth in the past with letters. And I've included a uh, self uh, addressed uh, letter and a stamp on that letter for them to reply and they don't seem to and the article carries on to say yet what flourishes today on the fringes of the internet was much more prominent in the 1920s in the activities of a movement that included physics professors and even no bar laureates. So people were criticizing Einstein's relativity in the 1920s and they were these uh, physics professors and so forth. 
So people criticising Einstein's relativity are carrying on in a grand tradition. The article then raises questions. It says, who were Einstein's opponents? Question mark. Why did they oppose one of the most important scientific theories of the 20th century? Question mark. And was Einstein right in saying political affiliation was responsible for the fierce opposition to relativity theory? Question mark. And presumably the article is going to try to answer some of those questions. But I don't think it's was that successful. So the article continues. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to access papers belonging to the physicist Gerke, one of the most outspoken critics of Einstein in Germany. As I delved into the material, he had neatly collected in banana boxes, a whole world of anti-relativity emerged from hundreds of pamphlets, thousands of newspaper clippings and piles of letters from Einstein's opponents across Europe and uh, the US, United States. So it's interesting to note who Gerke was. Uh, and this is Gerke. This is a picture of him. And according to Wikipedia, he was a German experimental physicist. He was the director of the optical department at the Reich Physical and Technical Institute. He, and it so it goes on to tell you, he was anti-relativist. He was a speaker of an event organized in 1920 by the Working Society of German Scientists. So he was a physicist criticizing Einstein's relativity. So Wikipedia says, uh, like a number of other prominent physicists of the time, including uh, Lorentz, Gierke, and experiment, experimentalist, was not prepared to give up the concept of the luminescence ether. And for this and various other reasons, had been highly critical of Einstein's theories of relativities, at least since 1911. So Einstein becomes famous in 1919, that Gierke was criticizing Einstein for much earlier than that. He was criticizing Einstein for 1911. So he had an early start of many of the Einstein relativity crit critics who only really noticed Einstein from 1919 when Einstein became famous. Anyway, the New Scientist article continues. I discovered that the group opposing relativity was much broader than many historians believed till now, and that their tactics had much in common with those used by creationists and climate change deniers today. Their reasons for countering relativity were also more complex and varied than is usually thought. Even Einstein misjudged the motivations of many of his opponents. So my comment on that is, in other words, there are still pe many people who don't believe what mainstream science tells them. And the issue of people not believing mainstream science was not exclusive exclusive to just the issue of what Einstein was saying. Anyway, the article carries on and we get back to Gierke. Gierke was an experimental physicist at the Imperial Technical Institute in Berlin. Like many experimentalists of that era, he felt uncomfortable with the rise of a theory that demanded a reformulation of the fundamental concepts of space and time. Relativity messes with these to the extent that events which one observer deems simultaneous are no longer simultaneous as viewed by observers moving in different frames of reference. So my comment is yes, uh, what relativity messes with does not make sense. It did not make sense to Gierke back then and it still does not make sense to many people even today. Um, 
nothing has been said since Gierke to convince us, that, which is the diehard sceptics of Einstein's relativity, as to why those things needed to be messed up. Article says Gierke could not imagine such a scenario. Um, I.e., is my comment, why those things needed to be messed up. Article says in 1921, this is Gierke, he argued that giving up the idea of absolute time threatened to confuse the basis of cause and effect in natural phenomena. And my comment is exactly it confuses and also makes no sense. No explanation has ever seemed to be offered to make it make sense. Those who accept it seem to just accept even though it makes no sense. So the article carried on says, what's more, the theory of relativity abandoned one of the most important concepts of 19th century physics that light waves and electric and magnetic forces were carried in a medium called the ether. For a classical physicist like Gierke, giving up this notion was akin to someone today claiming that sound waves travel in a vacuum. So my comments are, ah, they are now on to the ether issue. Putting aside the issue of sound waves and vacuum because there's a problem uh, that there's no, not really such a thing as a perfect vacuum. So onto the issue of the ether itself. If we go back to this paper, uh, putting aside the translation problems which I've pointed out in lots of other videos, this is the paper that Einstein starts his theory of relativity from, and it's called On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies uh, from 1905. And Einstein in it says, uh, the introduction of a luminescence ether will appear to be superfluous, etc. And my comments are, those who believe there's no ether seem to interpret superfluous as meaning the ether does not exist. First of all, I would like to dispute that interpretation of the word. Superfluous can mean it exists, that's the ether exists, but it's not going to be dealt with in the paper. So people are interpreting that paper of 1905 as saying the ether doesn't exist, but Einstein is using the word superfluous. So he's not explicitly saying the ether does not exist in that paper. But anyway, moving on to 1920, thus moving on to 1920, Einstein says, Recapitulating, we may say that according to the general theory of relativity, space endowed with physical qualities, in this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. So Einstein seems, my comment is, he seems to be saying there's some sort of ether. Uh, people start arguing about that. Is he really saying that? Einstein could write things more clearly, but he does seem to be saying there's some sort of ether. That's when the article says, What's more, the theory of relativity uh, abandoned one of the most important concepts of 19th century physics. Uh, that does not make sense. This is the article on the relativity deniers. It's the relative, that article is not making sense. And this is an example of where it does not make sense. People who believe in relativity say things that do not make sense. In this case, when they say there is no ether, that does not make sense. Einstein does not seem to agree with them when, when they say that. They try to uh, take Einstein as the authority for them saying that there's no ether, but Einstein does not really seem to be saying that. Hence, what they say does not make sense. Article continues, uh, these objections were first raised in scholarly journals with discussion restricted to academia. And the objection, my comment is, the objection is being referred to as the abandonment of the ether. The article continues, but after a key prediction of general 
relativity was confirmed during the eclipse in 1919, Einstein was transformed into a media star and the debate acquired a much broader public impact. In 1919, the New York Times published an article headlined, Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over the results of eclipse observations. While German magazines celebrated Einstein as a new science, as a new giant of world history. In the years that followed, the newspaper reported on everything from his clothing and Jewish background to his effect, affection for music. So my comment on that, yeah, it was a big publicity campaign from 1919 to portray Einstein as a ju super genius in the news media. Article continues, people are also troubled by more fundamental questions. In December 1921, the letters page of the Times of London carried a lively discussion of whether space is actually endowed with physical qualities as general relativity required. Opinion was uh, clearly divided. And my comment is, yeah, people started arguing about relativity. Um, opinions was clearly divided uh, because nothing was resolved. Article continues, the controversy in Germany intensified in August 1920 with the launch of a series of public lectures against Einstein at the Berlin Philharmonic Hall. The event included a lecture by Gerke who uh, repeated the arguments that he had been raising unsuccessfully for years. And I mind you, he, he started uh, er, earlier than 1919, he sort of started from about 1911, criticising Einstein and so carrying on, as well as an impassioned speech by the anti-Semitic activist uh, Paul Wayland, who had organised the series. The event made a clear impact, prompting Einstein to think seriously about leaving Germany. So Einstein was thinking of leaving Germany in 1920. So my comment is, it's, it's unfortunate that arguing about the physics then get tied in with anti-Semitism. Uh, Germany had lost World War I and German people needed someone to blame and that led to anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazis. Einstein became a superstar in the news media at the same time as the end of World War One, So he made himself a prominent target for someone to blame for losing World War One. Physics became meshed with politics of the time, and Einstein noted that, according to the article. Article says, Gerke's papers show that opposition to Einstein extended well beyond a handful of sidelined physicists and politically motivated troublemakers. Gierke was in touch with physics Nobel laureates uh, Stark and Leonard, and an international network comprising not just physicists, astronomers and philosophers, but also engineers, physicians and schoolmasters. So my comment is, is a large number of people from the sciences opposed to Einstein's relativity and that's pointed out earlier because it was because it did not make sense. Einstein's relativity didn't make sense. So the art, article uh, then goes on to mention the Academy of Nations and Reuter Dahl. So Professor Reuter Dahl, who had been exploring the worlds conquered by Einstein since 1902, declared that he was right to meet the much heralded mathematician at any time in a written debate and that he was prepared to prove that Einstein's theory is largely bunk. Weiterdahl used the scientific word for it but that's, that's what he meant so the, the Wikipedia is saying it started from 1902 and that date is probably wrong but basically Weiterdahl was opposing Einstein's relativity. 
article then mentions uh, Charles Lane Paul, and Charles Lane Paul was an American astronomy professor, and he was noted for his opposition to Einstein's theory of relativity. So, so the article continues when Oetterdahl approached Gierke in 1921 with the idea of setting up a German branch of the Academy of Nations. Gierke immediately welcomed this new forum for activities against Einstein. His first recruits were German physicists who argued there was no need for relativity because classical physics could explain all the astronomical observations. Philosophers, engineers, uh, phys physicians and the you know, retired uh, Major General joined too. A partial membership list from 1921 included 30 members from 10 countries. Uh, so my comment is the idea there is no need for relativity because classical physics could explain all the astronomical observation is interesting. And let's look at what a relativity expert nowadays says. So this is Kit Thorne. He's an American theoretical physicist named for his contributions in gravitational physics and astrophysics. And he says, Einstein and Newton with their very different viewpoints on the nature of space and time give very different names. And he's talking about when objects fall down through gravity and, and their conversion to a point on the center of the earth as they fall. And he says, Einstein calls it space-time curvature, Newton calls it tidal gravity. But there is just one agent acting, therefore space-time curvature and tidal gravity must be precisely the same thing expressed in different languages. And that's from his book, Black Holes and Time Warts. So when Newton is talking about tidal gravity theory, that's the same thing as Einstein's general relativity, except they're talking about it from different languages. Einstein's talking about it for as a space-time curvature for the tidal force, and uh, Newton is just talking about it as tidal force. So thus the uh, relativity denies straight skeptics with their view, view that there's no need for relativity because classical physics could explain all astronomical observations were correct. Uh, the New Scientist article does not point that out. If the majority of believers in relativity are still stating the opposite view, then that is something else about relativity which does not make sense. So the article continues uh, in New Scientist. The chance to cooperate with allies in the fight against relativity was obviously one reason. Einstein's opponents found themselves in the unenviable position of outsider, their arguments dismissed as all crop by most physicists. Scholarly journals and scientific associations closed their doors to them. The establishment of self-governing academy and journal must have come as a welcome opportunity to break out of the marginalized position. And my comments are close to all is, in other words, censorship. So the mainstream journals were censoring them and uh, they had to set these uh, opponents to Einstein's relativity, had to then set up their own journals. Mainstream science community is not open to different points of view and instead imposes or tries to impose its dogma and Einstein's relativity became the dogma. Opposition to it was censored. So I'll remind you of uh, what happened to poor little Galileo. Galileo faced his users in the establishment who tried to censor him and it was mainly the church in his day, but you still got the establishment today, and the establishment today uh, carries on the grand tradition of trying to censor things. So any modern 
uh, Galileo finds himself facing the establishment who's trying to uh, censor him. Unfortunately, Einstein's relativity uh, becomes the establishment's point of view, which they're trying to impose on everybody. So as a side note, this person is uh, Horton Art. He is often portrayed as a modern day Galileo by the distance because his astronomical observations, uh, the mainstream establishment doesn't like. So the original Galileo made astronomical observations. The establishment didn't like it. And now we've got a modern day version of him, which is Halton Arp, and he's made astronomical observations, which the establishment don't like. So the thing just keeps going on and on. Establishment doesn't learn. It tries to uh, suppress different points of view from the dogma, which he tries to impose on us. Article continues, and another motivation was more noble. Einstein's opponents were seriously concerned about the future of science. They did not simply disagree with the theory of general relativity. They opposed the new foundations of physics altogether. And that's the foundations for Einstein's relativity. The increasingly mathematical approach of theoretical physics collided with the then widely held view that science is essentially simple mechanics comprehensible to very every educated layperson. Uh, so in my viewpoint, Mainstream is just making a mess of everything in physics with their supposedly new foundations. And the article continues, this way of thinking can be traced back to the 19th century heyday of popular science where many citizens devoted their leisure to the pursuit of scientific understanding and simple theories of gravity or electricity were widely discussed in scientific magazines. My comment on that is, yes, physics was once easy to understand back then before they started to make a mess of things. The article continues, relativity represented a quite different way of understanding the world. It was a theory that only 12 white men could comprehend, uh, the New York Times declared in 1919. I don't know who those supposed 12 wise men were. And uh, my comments are, uh, physics was then being presented as very complicated to understand, and you had to be very clever to understand it. Contrast that now with the fairy tale of the emperor's new clothes. So in this little fairy story, the emperor has new clothes. And the, uh, the emperor was supposed to have invisible clothes that could only be seen if you were very clever. If you were stupid, then you were supposed to be unable to see the clothes. And the emperor appeared naked. Thus, in order not to seem stupid, you had to pretend you could see the clothes. Um, and the same thing applies to relativity. You are supposed to be able to understand it if you're very clever. It appears nonsense to you. Then you have to pretend that you uh, understand it to appear clever, i.e. it's a con job, a confidence trick. Article continues. The increasing role played by advanced mathematics seem to disconnect physics from reality. Mathematics is the science of the imaginable, but natural science is the science of the real. And Gerke stated in 1921 that. And this engineer uh, who found relatively incomprehensible went further and he said, this is not science. On the contrary, it's a new branch of metaphysics. My comment, thus people like this uh, thought relativity was nonsense, were deemed merely as not being able to understand it, as per the Empress New Clothes con job. If you said it, said it was not, Einstein's relativity was nonsense, you were dismissed as not being clever enough to understand it. Skipping on, so why? Relativity was accepted via the 
emperor's new clothes, of course, then led to conspiracy theories. Uh, article raises the questions. So was Einstein right to blame political affiliation for the opposition to the theory of relativity question mark? The answer is more complex than a simple yes or no. Article says for a start, someone's views about whether time could be stretched were not defined by ethnicity, nationality, religion or political convictions. Einstein's opponents included people who held progressive views and some who were due of Jewish descent. So it would be simplistic to uh, characterize the fight against relativity in the 1920s as a one-sided nationalistic or anti-Semitic campaign. And my comment is people were opposed to relativity from a multitude of different points of view, from different political beliefs, different religious beliefs, etc. It's unfortunate that it gets mixed in with anti-Semitism has been another reason why people didn't like it, but there are, are reasons for not liking Einstein's relativity other than that. Article continues, nevertheless, those who oppose the theory were not above attacking Einstein the person, the Democrat, the pacifist, the Jew. So Einstein was uh, being interpreted as being a Democrat by this article and also a pacifist. And it's also a point out he was a Jew. Leonard, for instance, was an early adherent of Nazism and a proponent of the nationalist and anti-Semitic German physics. By 1922, he was already ranting about the Jewish alien spirit that uh, he claimed the theory of relativity incorporated. My comment is, is it's unfortunate with people that when they oppose certain ideas, they then can go on to attack the person that proposed the ideas. Thus, people who didn't like relativity were not always content with attacking relativity, but often went on to attack the man where those ideas came from. And that went on to becoming uh, conspiracy theories. As the article notes, aware of their marginalised position, as the people proposing Einstein's relativity, many of Einstein's opponents turned to anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories. So marginalising people and not letting them uh, have their views published in science journals, uh, mainstream science journals, and that then leads them thinking of conspiracy theories. So this suppression which Galileo faced from the establishment and which the establishment is still around trying to suppress uh, different points of view in the sciences uh, that leads then to conspiracy theories. As the article points out, it then led to the point of view by the relativity deniers. Our trouble in America is that all scientific journals are closed to the anti relativists through Jewish influence. So that's the conspiracy theory. Uh, the daily press is almost entirely under the control of the Jews. Oytedal wrote in 1923. So suppressing these people who are saying that Einstein's relativity was wrong led to these conspiracy theories to, from them trying to explain why they were being dismissed. From this position, it was easy for Einstein's opponents to see themselves as victims rather than aggressors. In their interpretation of reality, the mere existence of relativity theory and the non-acceptance of arguments against it qualified as attack on them. And my comment is, i.e. their point of view about relativity was being censored and they had to come up with a reason why they were being censored. 
article continues, by the mid-1920s, Einstein's opponents were facing overwhelming resistance and most refrained from taking a public stance against the theory of relativity. Uh, many of them uh, simply gave up and the Academy of Nations ceased to s serve as the central organization campaigning against Einstein, th though it lingered on until the early 1930s. But the anti-relativists did not revise their opinions. In 1951, Gerke was still writing letters about the fight against relativity. And he's right, the day will come where everything, but everything about the theory will be abandoned by the world at large. But when will this be? Question mark, he asked. My comment is, so the resistance to relativity petered on, but still lingered on in reduced numbers. It is interesting to note that what was called relativity denials, the article was called uh, also anti-relativitists. So the revival in anti-relativity uh, came with uh, such groups as this one, which was the Natural uh, Philosophy Alliance. That, be it, that then evolved to become called the John Trappel Natural Philosophy Society. And the John Trappel Natural Philosophy Society has people who uh, are opposed to Einstein's relativity. But they also got people other different points of view. It's a sort of like open f uh, discussion forum. The article continues the debate about relativity lingers on today. Uh, Though the new generation of Einstein's opponents have mostly moved their protests online, it's on the internet, they share some fundamental characteristics with their predecessors. Uh, these perhaps show us best on the conservative website Conservapedia, which uh, uses wiki uh, technology to allow people to document counterexamples to relativity. Conservapedia claims that relativity is heavily promoted by liberals and lists 32 uh, reasons why the theory is wrong. I, I looked at the website for it and found that it's increased its numbers of reasons from 32 to more, and, and the list keeps, seems to be keep growing. Unfortunately, some of those beliefs, uh, some of those reasons are connected to uh, citing the Bible, so it's Bible belief, and um, bringing the Bible to uh, science is of course problematic, in my view. But it's correct to point out there is a tendency for relativity to be believed by liberals over non-liberals. Article continues, Einstein's critics continue to perceive relativity as a threat to their worldview and often invoke conspiracy theories to explain their marginalized position. And because it's a threat, it is a threat. So if you've got a point of view that Einstein's relativity is wrong, you're finding your point of view being censored to a large extent. And if you're being censored, well, therefore it must be a conspiracy to censor you, in which case it must be a conspiracy theory. So the people that are doing the censoring, they are a conspiracy. And to pretend that they're not a conspiracy is just them lying. So the article continues, uh, referring to the difference between protest against relativity in the 1920s and what is today. Uh, the article says there is a difference, though, the protests against relativity in the 1920s had closer ties to the academic world. And my comment is, back in the 1920s, the voice opposing uh, relativity was allowed a bit more in academic journals. Since then, it's become more suppressed. So, you, you since the 1920s, more censorship has started up, and so. They, they try to stop people becoming uh, an academic if you're opposed to Einstein's relativity. 
is its ongoing uh, censorship. Article continues, this was not because Einstein's opponents back then offered more convincing arguments, but because the paradigm shift that was moving physics on, on to new foundations was still underway. And that my comment is from the anti-relativist, i.e. relativity skeptics or relativity diverse, you want to call them, point of view, that paradigm shift was a mistake. So the article continues, the controversy over relativity represents a scientific dispute that is crucially shaped by the participants' worldviews and draws heavily on metaphysical conceptions of reality. And my comment on that is exactly there is a worldview that readily accepts relativity, which from the opposite point of view is seen as just accepting the emperor's new clothes con job. Article continues, like those who oppose Darwin's theory of evolution, Einstein's opponents back in the 1920s were impervious to reason criticism, just as uh, his critics today are. And my comment on that, uh, best not to get on, diverted onto evolution theory and put that issue aside. The acquisition that uh, relativity skeptics are impervious to reason criticism is deemed false by the relativity uh, skeptics and instead it's the relativity believers that are impervious to reasoned criticism of relativity. So both points, both sides can deem the other is impervious to reasoned uh, criticism. The article continues, physicists do sometimes try to discuss relativity theory with their opponents and point out their misunderstandings, just as physicists did 90 years ago, but this will not resolve the controversy. My comment, from the relativity skeptic's point of view, the misunderstandings are by the relativity believers and not on their side of relativity skepticism. The relativity believers, they get nowhere because they come over with their strongly held false beliefs in relativity, so are totally unconvincing. The article then carries on. The opponents understanding the very nature of science differs so fundamentally from the academic consensus that it may be impossible to find common ground. So my comment is, it looks that way, no common ground. From the relativity skeptic's point of view, Relativity does not make sense, and the relativity believers have nothing to offer to make sense of relativity other than telling people to believe relativity without question, even though it makes no sense. And I'm just making a comment on the word incommensurable. Maybe that word explains things when there's no common ground. So thank you, that's the end of this little talk on the in defense of uh, relativity deniers who are better called relativity skeptics. And from their point of view, Einstein's relativity does not make sense. And the people who believe it, the Einstein believers, are actually uh, believing the emperor has new clothes when actually the emperor is going around naked in the case of Einstein's relativity, it does not make sense. But the uh, believe, believers want to believe it, even though it does not make sense. And why they want to believe it does not make sense. Thank you.